help you sleep, give you something to simmer down the extraneous peripheral thoughts of the day, give you something to focus on, and what better place to take your mind when you're trying to relax than space. So let's pour over the space age history. Thank you. 
those of you as a brief heads up if you'd like to watch this in <laughs> if you'd like to listen to this with your uh, with your phone off in podcast form I do have these more recent episodes at least in some of the more popular older episodes up on Spotify and iTunes and generally anywhere you might consume your podcast content because I certainly hate that YouTube makes you pay to be able to listen to a video's audio with with the phone off you know um, so starting in 1903 with her handy Jamaican wand as many of you viewers will recognize. I did not get this in Ollivanders. Got this in Ocho Rios. 1903. Constantine Tsiolkovsky, astronautics pioneer in Russia, publishes an article on spaceflight. The first mathematical that travel by rocket is, in fact, possible. Here we have a pretty cool, kind of postmodern, Andy Warhol-esque picture of Albert Einstein riding his bicycle. He had a famous phrase, I don't know if he invented it, but he certainly made it popular. Just like riding a bicycle, the only way to not fall in life is to keep moving forward. I always liked that when I read his, uh, his biography by Walter Isaacson. Maybe I'll link that in the description because that was a that was a really really fun, engaging, interesting read. In 1905, Albert Einstein above is his special theory of relativity, a description of the structure of space and time that revolutionizes science. And uh, this proved that Newtonian physics, the, the cumulative name for physics, the paradigm of physics before Einstein's version, that that was just a subset of Einstein's physics where gravity wasn't extremely warped by massive objects or, or objects moving slow much, much slower than the speed of light so about 10 years later in 1916 Carl Schwarzschild, a German physicist, introduces the modern black hole concept. The French astronomer Pierre Laplace first suggested the idea way back in about 120 years before, in 1796. And he was also, Laplace also introduced the concept along with Kant of potential swirling masses of stars existing independently on, in islands amid the vast space of the universe. And uh, short shield is, um, as a namesake for the phenomena of a black hole, um, I believe it's the short shield radius, the distance at which, so it's a, it's the radius around a black hole, the distance from a black hole at which the escape velocity would exceed the speed of light. So that's significant because anything um, closer than that will absolutely not be able to escape the gravitational pull of a black hole. That is uh, effectively the event horizon um, beyond which nothing is able to be observed from outside it. So a year later in 1917, U.S. astronomer Harlan
size of our galaxy. This discovery put the sun not at the center, but about 30,000 light years out towards the edge of our Milky Way galaxy. Moving out to the middle column here. Shows a picture of Edwin Hubble looking through a... Um, the, the perspective is kind of weird, so I don't know how big that telescope is, but... I would guess it's very large. Oh yeah, it says... Of course it says it right here. Astronomer Edwin P. Hubble proves that galaxies exist outside our galaxy, the Milky Way. And Hubble later studies galaxies with the powerful Schmidt telescope, pictured above here, at Mount Palomar Observatory in California. Around the same time that Edwin Hubble was observing the pulsing Cepheid variable stars and watching them redshift, which proved that not only were there, mil were there galaxies outside the Milky Way, but that these galaxies were themselves expanding and receding from all other galaxies, including ours, thus proving Einstein's gravitational constant of the universe. We had strides, the first breakthroughs in rocket science, performed by Robert H. Goddard, an Auburn, Massachusetts physicist Goddard. He launches his first successful liquid-fueled rocket. And here we have his little makeshift rocket frame, which held, I guess, vertically his rockets upright. In 1927, a year later, Belgian cosmologist Georges Lemaitre formulates the Big Bang Theory. This proposes that all matter and space, the entire universe that we had known so far was born out of a colossal explosion of a primeval atom. From a singularity, and so five years after discovering and proving that galaxies exist outside our own Milky Way in 1929, Edwin Hubble finds that the more distant a galaxy, the faster it recedes. Hubble's law demonstrates that the universe is indeed expanding. As Einstein's equation initially predicted, uh, before Einstein corrected it artificially, uh, because he wasn't able to believe that the universe wouldn't be perfectly static and perfectly balanced. He, he didn't want to believe that God would allow an expanding universe with no bounds. Now in 1930, at the Lowell Observatory in Flag Flagstaff, Arizona, Clyde Tombaugh discovers the ninth planet, Pluto. <laughs> and remember, this book was written in 1986. It's now called a dwarf planet. He discovered it by following the calculations of Percival Lowell, a famous, another famous astronomer. A year later, in 1931, American pioneer of radio astronomy, Carl Jansky, picture.
picture to both you're looking at some I suppose chalkboard drawings of what looks like it maybe radio emissions from different constellations he discovers radio waves coming from the Milky Way galaxy itself Six years later, astronomer Carl, or Grote Ripper, sorry, follows up Carl Jansky's work and builds the first dish radio telescope. And moving on a couple years, of course, World War II, right in the midst of it. I'll zoom out. to return pictures of the far side of the moon. 
would say that's about three days in space, orbiting the Earth. Orbiting the Earth, orbiting the Earth. That's pretty cool. Now we hear more of a, much more of a purely astronomical discovery or breakthrough. Martin Schmidt at the Mount Palomar interprets the Mount Palomar Observatory interprets the unusual behavior, the unusual behavior of a radio star, 3C237, the first known quasar. side. 
just watched the uh, the first Man movie with Ryan Gosling, and they did a great portrayal of how how specific their calculations would have to be to navigate two spacecraft, each going about seventeen thousand miles an hour. Cruising in orbit, cruising alongside each other, and cruising at the same speed, nonetheless. Because you think about it, even um, what's 100 miles relative to 10,000 miles an hour? That's 1 100, that's 1%. So 100 miles an hour difference. They could be zooming past you at 100 miles an hour, and that would roughly be about a, about a half a percent difference in speed. So they had to specify the, the speed and velocity of the spacecraft to within less than, you know, one one thousandth of a percent of their total velocity in, in order to rendezvous in orbit, and then wait until they have to talk with each other. Their precision and skill and innovation and just sheer discipline it takes to coordinate that much, that much technology in those many people, that many people together is, it's, um, it's inspiring, I think very inspiring. So, and then in December as well, we have Frank Borman and James Lovell Jr. complete a, a 206 Earth, no, Earth orbits in Gemini 7, 200 orbits. A 14-day flight proves that travel possible. That's about how long it, it would have taken. Now moving up here. Looks like we got some moon images here. In February of the following year, so a couple months after the 200 day orbit by Borman and Lovell. February, the USSR Luna 9 now, Luna 9, Luna 9, soft lands on the moon, soft lands on the moon, and relays the first pictures directly from the lunar surface, and, um, and then March, a month later, the USSR launches Luna 10, the first spacecraft to orbit the moon. Here we go. So now, again, because this is an arms race, a technology race, that means by definition they're at similar paces and similar levels of achievement. So, the Soviets have reached the moon in 1965, 1966, sorry, and the U.S. is uh, certainly feeling the pressure, certainly, certainly under the gun, so to speak. So, a couple months later, Surveyor 1, June, in June of 66, the first U.S. spacecraft to soft land on the moon, meaning I guess meaning not a crash. <laughs> that would be a hard land. On the moon, it takes a picture of its own shadow right here. Let's get that in the frame. There we go. 
did variable stars, they do vary the brightness in a predictable way, but they don't pulse as rapidly, I guess. Okay, so I just looked up the difference between a Cepheid variable and a pulsar, and I suppose a Cepheid is actually a young supergiant that is, fl is undergoing a constant flux, a predictable flux that we can use to predict, um, that has a uh, steady relationship between its cycle or frequency of flux and the size and brightness. So it's it's a star that it's a star that has a constant um, let's see constant relationship of proportionality between its brightness and its or its luminosity as they call it and its period of cyclical brightening and dimming due to whatever size it is. Uh, and so it does produce a cyclical pulsing, but it's not a pulsar because those are spinning neutron stars that are way smaller and way more compact and emit beams like lighthouse beacons from their north and south poles, I believe, or might be around their equator, but I would, I would guess it's, um, well, yeah, I guess it, it would have to be around their equator because it would be a direct, because it would be a constant stream of electrons. If it was coming out their north and south poles, there would be no row the rotation wouldn't change its position on the surface of the neutron star, so yeah, I guess it does come out of its a single beam somehow that comes out of its equator or somewhere on the laterally rotating portion of the neutron star, so that's interesting. But yeah, there are two different types of stars. And the spinning neutron star, the pulsars, are ro rotating much more rapidly. Rotating much, much more rapidly. So, so because of the the speed and the precision at which the pulse is received, if it's oriented so that it actually happens to even hit the Earth then uh, it's much more likely to be taken as an intelligent communication. But we now know that it is not. Unless, of course, the there was an advanced civilization um, so far along technologically that they could create and uh, precisely aim a neutron star at, at a, a specific place such as Earth, that would be something, and um, really not entirely out of the realm of possibility, so I like to be optimistic, at least, keep my options open. So in September, of 1968 now, the Soviet Zond 5 is the first spacecraft to orbit the moon and return to Earth. Uh, its cargo includes plant and animal life to test radiation danger in space, and they 
satellite Uhuru, the, uh, the black female on the original Star Trek. Scientists designate Cygnus X1 the first probable black hole. So in May of 1973, the U.S. launches Skylab, a space station. Venus. 
it there. And hope you'll come by for the next episode. I'm working on a script right now to discuss and look into the new photograph. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. The new photograph, the image, I guess, is really what it is of the accretion disk of the M87 black hole. So uh, that one might actually, I might use, I might rely heavily on the really awesome videos and CGI's renderings of, of NASA and the European Space Agency, the ESA as well. So I might turn that one into more of a documentary style thing. Uh, if you guys like that so thank you for all your support your your in any shape or form you uh, you guys really encourage me to keep keep moving forward and exploring the next topic and putting these out and um, the donations are ridiculously incentivizing um, they're so encouraging it's just inspiring that uh, I can share my love of learning and you guys enjoy it. So, sleep well. Tomorrow's a new day. I'll see you guys then. Bye.